we are all very familiar with the concept of autopilot for an airplane. It's an intricate network of sensing and control systems that work to make the human pilot of the plane aware of what is going on in every single subsystem of the plane. And the pilot can use that information to enhance his ability to safely fly the plane to its destination. Ladies and gentlemen, what I want to talk to you about today is how we can use wearable sensing technology, like this small device that I'm wearing on my wrist right now, to monitor and make ourselves aware of what's going on in each and every subsystem of our bodies. And we can use that information to uh, enhance our ability to make good decisions about our lifestyle and ultimately about our health. Before I go on, there's a couple of important things I'd like you to remember about autopilot. The first is that it has become an absolutely integral part of flying today. And this is because it greatly enhances the ability of the pilot to fly the plane. And the second is that it doesn't replace the pilot, and it never will. The human expertise of that pilot will always be the most essential part of flying. I don't know about you, but I certainly wouldn't be happy boarding a commercial jet knowing that there was no human in control at all. But by the same token, nor would I be happy to board a plane knowing that there was no technology helping out. I think this balance and interdependence between technology and human expertise is it's something that's becoming more and more a part of our everyday lives now. Um, there was a pilot interviewed after the uh, crash landing in San Francisco airport this summer. And he made a very nice analogy. He said, uh, a plane can't fly itself any more than an operating room with all of its advanced technology is able to perform an organ transplant by itself. And this analogy with healthcare really stuck with me because even though we're bringing technology more and more into our healthcare systems, and um, I think the time is coming that we bring it more into our everyday lives and how we manage our own health. The time is coming that we, we take this technology that's available to us now and we use it to shift healthcare into, into autopilot. Now, before the medical professionals in the audience tell me that I'm trying to propose the end to their career, in the same way that I've said that the human pilot is always going to be the most essential part of flying, the, the fundamental part of our healthcare system will always be the human expertise and decision making of doctors and other medical professionals. And the other thing that people often say to me when I talk about switching healthcare into autopilot is that they're not comfortable with the idea of using technology and relying on technology for something as vital as their health. And what I want to show is that this isn't something scary that's going to take control away from you. The opposite is really true. It's something that by monitoring what's going on in our bodies and in our lives, we become more aware of ourselves. And we're then able to make healthier choices. You might ask why I believe that all of this is going to happen or why I believe that it should happen. There's a lot of recent studies and um, we've seen that in the US, and we can broadly assume that similar numbers across other parts of the developed world, 40% of premature deaths are caused by behavioral patterns. Among these, the three largest contributors are smoking, alcohol, and obesity or inactivity. Not one of these three behavioral patterns is something for which we are lacking information or lacking education. We know that these habits are bad for us. And yet, as a society, we continue to ignore the risks. And I believe that the reason we ignore these risks is because it's too easy to do so. It's very easy for any of us to convince ourselves that we live a very active life because we go to the gym twice a week. But if you imagine that at the end of each week, somebody presented you with a summary of the number of hours you spent sitting at your desk, sitting in your car in traffic, uh, sitting in front of the TV at home, or the number of times you took the elevator instead of the stairs. Faced with all of those facts, it's much more difficult for us to focus just on what we want to see or what we want to remember. The other part of the, the why for all of this is 
not so much about self-awareness, but it's about how we can use sensing technology to give our doctors a better picture of what's going on in our lives. I worked a couple of years ago with um, a psychiatrist, and most of his patients were suffering from depression. He had a very hard time painting a clear picture of what was going on in their lives. The reason for this was because he had to base that picture on interviews he did with his patients and their families. And he told me that his patient would come in one week and he'd say, John, how did you get on this week? And John would say, oh, doctor, I was terrible this week. I didn't leave the house at all. And then John's wife would be asked the same question. And she'd say, he was much better this week. He got, he got up from the TV and he had dinner with the family three times. And John's daughter would tell a totally different story again. And the psychiatrist's problem was not that these people weren't telling the truth but that each of them was telling the truth as they saw it, and that was a subjective truth. And what he really needed was an objective and factual summary of what was going on in his patients' lives so that he could then ask focused and contextualized questions. And what he wanted to be able to do was say, John, I see here on Tuesday you had a lot of activity. Did you go for a walk, and how did you feel then? I've given you two examples of the why for this. Um, so now you might ask, how is this all supposed to happen? And the answer to that is wearable sensing technology. So if I can just ask you in the audience today, how many people would wear or perhaps already do wear um, a smart watch or uh, another device like a Fitbit or a Pebble or a, any of these devices like I have today that, that monitors your movement or other signals? There, maybe. Getting close to half of you, I can't see all of you up above. So, what about if I asked the question, would you change your mind if I said, would you swallow that sensor? Would you have it implanted under your skin? See, one, two, three, about, okay, less of you. <laughs> wearable technology that I've talked about, the smart watches and, and all of those devices, that's something that we're becoming more familiar with. And even if you think, a step back from that in your phone, people have pedometers and people are monitoring the number of hours they sleep for. And all of this is something we're, we're familiar with today. And just like the sensing systems as part of the autopilot in a plane are monitoring what's going on in every single subsystem of that plane, these are monitoring things like our movement and our biophysical data, things like our heart signals, our muscle contractions. They can even measure our emotional response to the world around us. Every year, they become smaller, they become more capable, and they become easier to wear and easier just to forget that they're there. And I wasn't talking science fiction, as I've been accused of, when I suggested that maybe we'll be swallowing these sensors or having them implanted under our skin. In fact, ingestible sensors are already on the market, and I don't believe for a minute that the technology is going to stop there. With all this new technology at our fingertips, I think we need to, we need to think about how we're going to use it. There was um, the Internet Trends report for 2013 was recently released, and there it was observed that wearable technology is growing faster than the 10-year cycle that we've traditionally seen for technological innovation for decades. And I think it's very important that both as an industry and as a society, we look at what this means for us. So this technology is coming very, very fast, and we really need to make sure that we put it to good use. We need to I guess, become as aware of this technology as it is of us. I work um, as an applications engineer at Shimmer here in Dublin, and my job is all about taking sensed data and turning it into something meaningful. So something that can be interpreted by the user for their application, whatever, whatever that may be, from healthcare to sports and everything in between. And the methods and processes we use are so important that th there's still a lot of work to be done in this area. And that's how we're going to go from having this technology to really using it in our lives well. I think we have a duty um, not to run into this blindly. And I think we have you know, a responsibility to make sure that we do it right. Our doctors, they shouldn't just take the information that comes from technology and unquestionably accept it. 
Instead, what they need to do is they need to combine the information with all of their existing methods of gathering data. They need to build a full picture using every tool that they have available to them. And by this method, they can make the best decisions possible. I think they should even go one step further than this. And what they need to do is combine each piece of the picture with a level of confidence they have in that piece of information. So some of you may be aware of um, IBM's Watson machine that uh, defeated human opponents at a game of Jeopardy a number of years ago. Now, Watson was a machine that could essentially pull the internet and come up with an answer for any question that you could ask of it. But for playing Jeopardy, just giving out the best guess answer in each case wasn't going to win the game. So what Watson did was calculate a level of its confidence in each answer and whether that was correct. And it then used this information to decide intelligently whether to play or whether to hold back. And that kind of strategy is the best strategy that we can use when we're making a decision to take an action. Technology can provide us with a real and unbiased measure of how confident it is in an answer that it's giving us. So if you provide it with one day worth of data, it knows it doesn't really, it can't really give a, a good conclusion. If you provide it with a month's worth of data, then by looking at the patterns in that, it can give a more confident answer. Our subjective methods, like the psychiatrist interviewing his patients, lack that level of, of confidence. He can get a feel for how much he believes what one person is saying over the other, but he doesn't have that solid numerical figure that he can weight each piece of information with. And I think that's just one more of the ways that t technology can really make us more aware. I've mentioned that the, the processing and interpreting part of this whole puzzle has maybe a little bit of catching up to do with the technology that's moving so fast. But that by no means uh, is a reason why we shouldn't use the technology now and why we can't benefit already from, from all of this wealth of technology that's at our fingertips. And if you like, you can think of this as like the black box in a plane. So I'm sure most of you have been in the situation where you've been suffering from an ache or a pain or maybe you haven't slept in very well in a while. And you go to the doctor, you want to figure out why. And the first question that the doctor is going to ask you is how long has this been going on? Now you're in this situation and you might feel like you don't even remember the last time you had a good night's sleep and maybe it's really only been three days but you feel like it's been a month. It's very hard to genuinely give the doctor an, an accurate answer. But if you've been monitoring this data all along, you don't have to pay attention to it when everything is fine. But as soon as something starts to go a little bit awry, it's there, it's waiting, and it can be exploited. And I think this is why we need to embrace this technology now. And we need to start using it and start thinking of the different ways in which we can use it. That's when we're really going to see where, where more applications are. I think Fundamentally, there's no denying that by becoming a more aware society, we'll inevitably become a healthier one. We should use this technology, and I think we should make that first step now, shifting healthcare into an autopilot mode. Thank you. <laughs>